Hey everyone, welcome back to Code in Motion. Today we're looking at the top 14 most important lead code patterns that you absolutely need to know to ace your coding interviews. Instead of memorizing hundreds of lead code solutions, understand these 14 techniques to start acing your Google, Meta, and Amazon interviews as I've seen these patterns in all my interviews with these companies. With that said, let's get started. The first pattern is the sliding window. Now, when should you use this? Use this for linear data structures, such as arrays, lists, and strings. Use this when you need to find the shortest, longest, minimum, or maximum of a subarray. And finally, the subarray must satisfy some condition. Now, let's take a look at why we actually need this technique. If we don't have the sliding window and we want to find the longest substring without duplicates, notice that we need to use a double for loop over here. We start our i and j pointers and we move j until we find the duplicate, but the problem with this is that the time complexity is O of n squared. Can we do better? Can we be more optimal? Let's take a look at the same problem using the sliding window technique. In the sliding window technique, we move our j pointer as far as we can until it doesn't satisfy the constraint anymore. In this case, you see we found the duplicate a, and so we'll just move our i pointer until we're true again and then move j. Notice that now we found the duplicate b, so we'll move i again and then continue moving j until we hit the end of the array. Notice that in this approach, we're O of n instead of O of n squared. Now this is called a dynamic sliding window because the sliding window changes sizes throughout the algorithm. How about a constant or a fixed sliding window? Find the maximum subarray sum of size three. In this case, we can initialize a sliding window of size three and then move that along in the iteration and keep track of the sums and count the max sum. This is also O of n time complexity. To practice this pattern, you should look at the following leak code questions. Next up, we have the two pointer pattern. When should you use this? For linear data structures, such as before, when you need to scan the start and end of a list, if you have a sorted list and need to find pairs, and finally, if you need to remove duplicates or filter through the list. So why do we need this pattern? Suppose we want to find two numbers that sum up to eight. If we don't have this pattern, we have to use a double for loop, which is O of n squared time complexity until we find the pair that sums up to eight. Now let's take a look at how the two pointer technique could help us. If we have the same set of an array, what we could do is sort the array first. Now we could start two pointers at the ends of the list and we could sum up those numbers. If the sum is less than the target, then we move I. If the sum is greater than the target, then we move J. Finally, we find our result in O of n log n time. There's another use case over here when you want to detect if a string is a palindrome. You could start two pointers i and j at left and right, and if the letters are equal, you move both i and j. If they're not, then you know it's not a palindrome. The time complexity is O of n as well. To get more practice with this pattern, look at the following leak code questions. Next up, we have slow and fast pointers. When should you use this? If you have linear data structures, if you want to detect a cycle in a linked list, if you want to find the middle of a linked list, and finally, if you want to perform all of this in one pass with O of one space. Let's see why we need this. If we want to find a cycle in a linked list, the traditional way is to use a hash set, and for every node that you iterate through, you add it to the hash set. If you've seen that node before, then you know you found the cycle. However, the time complexity and space complexity is O of n for this. Can we do this in one pass using constant space? Let's see how that looks. We could initialize two pointers, a slow and a fast. Slow will move once, fast will move twice. Slow will move once, fast will move twice. Eventually, if there's a cycle, slow will intersect with fast. Now we have an O of n time complexity with constant space. Let's look at another case where we want to find the middle of a linked list. In this case, we could initialize slow and fast again, move slow once, move fast twice, and then when fast reaches the end of the list, slow is at the middle of the list. The time complexity is O of n, space is still constant, and we did this in one pass. To get more practice with this, look at the following lead code questions. Do you ever wish that you had coding templates for every lead code pattern? Well, now you do. Not only did I make this video, but I wrote up an entire blog with every single pattern, and each pattern has coding templates associated with them. For example, in the sliding window, I give you a generalized template for the shortest window, the longest window, and finally a fixed size window. If you want more practice with binary search, you could look at all the templates below. Classic binary search, finding a target where there's no duplicates. Modified binary search, where you need to find the left and rightmost indices of a target. And finally, searching an assorted rotated array. There's also coding templates for dynamic programming that's going to help you to truly understand the time and space complexities associated with all four variations of top-down and bottom-up approaches. Also, if you want to see all of these LeetCode problems that I suggest in animated format along with the Blind75 list, be sure to subscribe my channel and check out the content below.
The next pattern is reversing a linked list in place. When should you use this? If you want to reverse a linked list in one pass in constant space. If you want to reverse a specific portion of a linked list. And finally, if you want to reverse nodes in groups of K. Let's see how this works. If I have a linked list and I want to reverse this list, I'm going to initialize two pointers, previous and pointer, which is at the current node. At every single iteration, pointer.next has to point to the previous node, in this case, null. Now we move previous to pointer and we move pointer to the next node. We follow the same formula, pointer.next is equal to previous and we move previous and pointer along until we scan the entire list. At the end of the iteration, the previous pointer will point to the new head of the reversed list. This runs in O of n time complexity and constant space since we only use two variables. If you want more practice with this, solve the following leak code questions. Next up, binary search. When to use binary search? If your input is sorted and you need to find a number. If you need to find the position of insertion in a sorted list. If you need to handle duplicates in sorted arrays. And if you need to search in rotated sorted arrays. Now, as a refresher, let's look at regular binary search, the classic one where we're searching for a target in the array. If the mid value is less than my target, then I need to move the left pointer. If the mid value is greater than my target, then I move the right pointer all the way until I find my mid value, which is the target, which happens in log n time. Now let's take a look at a different example. What if I want to find the leftmost occurrence of a duplicated value, in this case four? Well, now we need to be smart with how we move the left and right pointers such that the left pointer is where the result is at the end of the algorithm. This also occurs in log n time. Now there's also another variation where you need to search in a rotated sorted array. So if we look at this case, four, five, six, and seven are sorted, zero, one, two are sorted. And so in this case, the array was shifted or rotated. Now we have to be smart with how we find zero inside of the array based on the left, right, and mid values. And finally, we converge at zero. This also happens in log n time. If you want more practice with this, feel free to look at the following leak code questions. Next up, we have top K elements. When should you use this pattern? When you want to find the top K smallest or largest elements. When you want to find the Kth smallest or largest element. And finally, when you want to find the K most frequent elements. Now let's see why we need this pattern. If we don't have this pattern, we're going to have to resort to sorting to find the top K most elements. We sort and then take the final elements of the array. This takes n log n time. Can we do better? Using a mint heap, we actually can. We could initialize the first k elements into the min heap and then heapify the heap. After that, for every element that's greater than the top of the heap, we pop out of the heap and then insert the new element. What this does is keep track of the top k most elements in the list. Now, why is this better than sorting? Because popping from a heap is log k time, so this time complexity is n times log k, which is better than n log n. To get more practice with this, look at the following leak code questions. Next up, we have binary tree traversal. When should you use this? Use the pre-order traversal when you want to serialize or deserialize a tree. In order when you want to retrieve the elements in sorted order, such as BSTs. Post order when you want to process the children before the parent, going bottom up. And lastly, use BFS when you want to scan level by level. Let's see how this looks in practice. Let's start with the pre-order traversal. First, we're going to scan the nodes before the children. So we scan four first, then two, then one, then three, then six, then five, then seven. In the in-order traversal, we're going to scan the leftmost child, then the current node, and then the right child. So that's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. In the post-order traversal, we scan the children before the node. That's going to be one, three, two, five, seven, six, and finally four. Now let's take a look at BFS. In the BFS, we scan level by level. That's gonna be four, two, six, one, three, five, and seven. If you want more practice with this, look at the following leak code questions. Next up, we have graphs and matrices. Use this pattern when you wanna search graphs or matrices. Use this pattern when you wanna explore all possible paths with DFS. Use BFS if you wanna find the shortest path distance. And finally, use topological sort if you need to order tasks based on dependencies. Let's see how this looks. Let's look at DFS first. In DFS, we're gonna scan the maximum path first and visit all nodes as we go through the path. That's gonna be 0, 1, 3, 7, 4, 8, 6, 5, and 2. Now we mark all the nodes as visited and return back from the recursion call. 
Let's look at BFS now instead. In BFS, we scan level by level, similar to the binary tree traversal. Now let's have a look at topological sort. Topological sort uses a direct acyclical graph. In topological sort, you have prerequisites for each node. Before we take node 1, we need to take node 0. Before we take node 7, we need to take node 3. In this approach, we use DFS and keep track of the last nodes we visited. Those are added to the end of the list. Prerequisites are visited before. Now let's take a look at matrices. In matrices, we also have a concept of DFS and BFS. DFS is similar to graphs, where we visit each node and find the longest path. In BFS, we visit the children nodes first. If you want more practice with these, look at the following Glee code questions. Next up, backtracking. When should you use this? If you have combinatorial problems, such as combinations, permutations, and subsets. If you have constraint satisfaction, such as solving Sudoku or N Queens. And finally, if you need to prune paths using constraints to reduce the search space. Let's see how this looks. If I want to solve Sudoku, I have to try every single possible number and look at what succeeds and what fails. Finally, I have a solution and I'm done. We could also start pruning paths. If I have a problem that says find all solutions using 2, 3, and 6 that sum up to 4, you can use an infinite amount of the numbers. Let's start off by taking 2 and another 2. In this case, we sum up to 4, so we're green. However, if we take 2 and 3, we sum up to 5, which is greater than 4. Therefore, we prune the branch and there's no need to go further. Similar to 2 and 6. At 3 and 3, we also are greater than 4, so we prune the branches. Notice how efficient we are by pruning branches we don't need to look at. For more practice, look at the following Glee code questions. Next up is everyone's favorite, dynamic programming. Use dynamic programming when you have overlapping subproblems. When you have optimization problems, such as finding the minimum maximum distance and profit. When you have sequence problems, when you have combinatorial problems, such as finding the number of ways to do something, and finally, when you want to reduce the time complexity from exponential to polynomial. Let's see how this looks. If we take the famous Fibonacci sequence, we could start out with a top-down approach. To solve Fibonacci of 4, we need to solve Fibonacci of 3, 2, 1, and 0. So we go all the way down in a recursive fashion. Notice that we're going to be solving Fibonacci of 1 and Fibonacci of 2 twice. We redo repetitive work. Therefore, the time complexity of this is O of 2 to the n and O of n space. Can we do better? Yes, we can. We could look at a top-down approach with memoization. Memoization just means storing subsequent results in a hash map called memo. Notice over here we're storing the results for Fibonacci 1, 2, 0, 3, etc. And notice over here that we completely prune the branches for Fibonacci 1 and Fibonacci 2. We don't re-explore those, we use the cached values. Therefore, the time complexity here is O of n, and the space is O of n as well. Now, instead of a top-down, we could look at a bottom-up approach. Bottom-up approach uses iteration instead of recursion, using an array to store previous values. So in this case, we use an array to store 0 and 1 for the initial base cases, and we could use pointers to calculate the next element. And finally, we get 3. The time complexity for this is O of n, and we also have O of n space. However, the bottom-up solution is generally preferred because you can be efficient with the space. For instance, did we really need the entire array? No, we only cared about the last two numbers. Therefore, instead of an array, we could only use two variables, prev2 and prev1, and solve this in constant space. Let's see how that looks. And there we have it. Now the time complexity is O of n and the space is constant space. If you want more practice with dynamic programming, be sure to look at the following questions. Next up is bit manipulation. Use this when you want to count the number of 0 or 1 bits in a number. If you need to add up two numbers without using addition and subtraction. And finally, if you need to find the missing number in a list. Let's see how this looks. If I want to find the number of 1 bits in 29, I first transform 29 to binary. Let's just verify that we have 29. Finally, what I need to do is end the number with 1 in order to get the least significant bit. If the least significant bit is 1, I add it to my result. If it's 0, we do nothing. Next, we shift the number to the right by 1 in order to continuously get the least significant bit. After the last iteration, the number is 0 and we're done. Now let's take a look at another example. Solve a plus b without using addition or subtraction. In this case, let's start with the least significant bits. 1 plus 1 is 10 in binary, so we put 0 for sum and carry a 1. Once again, 1 plus 1 is 10, so we put a 0 and carry a 1. The same exact thing happens again, and 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1, so the sum is 1. 
Some observations to make over here is that the carry is A and B shifted over one to the left column, and the sum is the XOR operator. If you want more practice, look at the following leak code questions. Overlapping intervals. Use this pattern when you want to merge or consolidate ranges. When you need to schedule or find conflicts, for example, meeting rooms. And when you need to find gaps or missing intervals. Let's take a look at a couple of use cases over here. In this case, there is no overlap, so we can't merge A and B. However, if A and B are overlapped, you need to use the formula the merged interval is the minimum between the start of A and B and the maximum between the two ends. Let's take a look at when B overlaps A, for instance. It's the same exact formula. Now let's take a look at an example. If I want to insert 4, 8 into a list of intervals, I'm going to keep track of the input and the merged interval. In this case, when we scan 1, 2, we notice that there's no overlap, so we just carry it. However, when we scan 3, 5, we notice there's overlap, so we expand the merged interval. 6 and 7 is contained, so nothing changes, and 8 and 10 forces us to expand once again. We notice that 12 and 16 does not intersect with the interval, and so we're left with this final output. To get more practice with this pattern, look at the following leak code questions. Next up is the monotonic stack. Use this when you need to find the next greater or smaller element in a list. When you need to find the left and right boundary points in a histogram or rectangle. And when you need to maintain elements in order to optimize operations. Why do we need this? Let's take a look at the following example. Return how far the next greatest element is for each element in the array. In this case, we're going to need to use a double for loop to constantly find the next greater element. The bad part about this is look how many repetitive calculations we made for the number of 76. This took O of n squared time. Can we do better? Let's take a look at a monotonic stack in this case. It's the same exact question with a stack. In this case, we start from the end of the list, and what we're trying to do is keep a decreasing order in the stack. First, we add 62. Now we go to 76. 62 is less than 76, so we pop from the stack. Now we add 76 and go to 57. 76 is greater than 57, so we found the next greatest element. Now we add 57 to the stack. We go to 69. 57 is less than 69, so we pop it off the stack. However, 76 is greater than 69, so we use it as a result. Now we add 69 to the top of the stack. Notice that we keep a decreasing order on the stack. 71 is greater than 69, so we pop it off the stack. 76 is greater than 71, so we add it to our result. Now we add 71 to the stack. We go to 75. 71 is smaller than 75, so we pop it. 76 is greater than 75, so we use it. We add 75 to the stack. Now we repeat the pattern for the last two elements and notice that we reduced our time complexity from O of n squared to O of n. The trade-off here was that we use O of n space now. To get more practice with this, look at the following leak code patterns. Now let's take a look at prefix sums. Use the prefix sum when you want to find cumulative sums from index 0 to any element in the array. When you want to query subarray sums frequently across multiple ranges, and finally when you have partial sums that can be reused efficiently. Let's take a look at an example. In this case, I want to find the sum of subarray 2 to 4. However, just imagine that I want to find the sum of the subarrays 2 to 4, 1 to 5, 0 to 3, etc. Multiple queries. In this case, we could calculate the prefix sums table and then use it to find the sum of subarrays in constant time. Let's see how that looks by first filling out the prefix sums table, and then we could see how we can use those results to perform efficient calculations. In this case, if I want to find the sum of 2 to 4, I could use the formula below. The sum of i to j is the prefix sum of j minus the prefix sum of i minus 1, and in this case we get 0. To get more experience with this pattern, look at the following leak code questions. And that is the end. Thank you so much for watching if you made it this far. If you're interested in more content like this, be sure to subscribe and check out my blog, which has the patterns coded out for you for every single technique. And if you want to see the Blind75 and all leak code questions that I mentioned in this video in animated format for the solutions, be sure to subscribe. I'll see you in the next one.